So I'm going to give you a background to uh, a little bit of what we're doing, a little bit about the space sector, and how we would try to address the problems we face, which are rather on the extreme end of the issues um, in terms of strategic uh, foresight, in terms of tackling innovation, tackling uh, the mindsets and the credibility gaps that we inevitably face when we're going just the other side of the frontier and pushing forward. So um, I'm going to kick off. What will an oil and gas company do in 15 years? Well, despite all the doom and gloom, uh, I think we can certainly say they'll be doing this. Um, and uh, that's what we need them to do. But believe it or not, it's also not going to be on Earth. Uh, there's going to be a, a lot of expansion. Uh, Earth-based territories are uh, one domain of the industries today, but it's going to expand. Currently, for example, Norwegian uh, oil sector has a global footprint, but in the, in the local geological uh, and geographic region, there's already extensive activity going on. And it's, it's basically the, um, the backbone or the maturation of the sector uh, in this country, and the same uh, occurs in many other uh, nations around the earth. Just uh, this month, uh, from UCL, um, in uh, collaboration with its partners, uh, a study came out uh, specifying the uh, regional limitations to uh, utilization of extracting uh, of resources that are to be extracted if we are to maintain a 2% limit on um, a 2 degree limit excuse me 2 degrees celsius limit on global warming uh, and the change in temperature uh, the obviously um, for today's uh, uh, context it's just interesting that the the findings suggested suggested, is always a, a great word, um, that 100% of oil and gas in the fields in the Arctic regions would have to remain untouched um, for us to meet our environmental uh, goals uh, as a species. So um, this, I'm sure, is going to cause an interesting debate over the coming months and years. As a, uh, as a species and a civilization, we have a number of energy sources that we are using. Uh, today. Uh, we have uh, a number of terawatts of absolute limits of uh, hydrocarbons uh, and then some renewable annual um, figures uh, that we see here. Of course, ground-based solar is the uh, largest, has the largest terawatt uh, magnitude of power availability um, for our civilization. But it is actually dwarfed when compared to um, something closer to the source, uh, space-based solar power. I'm sure many of you have heard of the concept, uh, concepts of space-based solar power. We'll go into that a little bit um, and why it's relevant. Shackleton Energy. Our mission is to build uh, a solar system economy, get humanity off the planet, industrialize, allow us to live off the land, and fuel the space frontier with our fueling stations in space. We've had a frontier for the best part of our civilization. Our species has grown on it. It's been ingrained in our culture, in our uh, folklore, in our society, and in the very systems that we use to distribute and rationalize resources. That open frontier has stimulated growth, it stimulated innovation, it stimulated ideas and technological uh, development. As we've matured through various stages of uh, civilizational growth and plateaus, uh, we come to a point where we have a final frontier on the surface of the Earth um, round about the turn of the uh, 19th to 20th century. Effectively, what followed then was a folding over of the uh, requirements to then build a new um, opportunity to create additional growth. Without a frontier, the very pinnacle of innovation, the pinnacle of daring, of boldness, of new ideas, of freedom to innovate, starts to get curtailed. And it may be decades before you start noticing this effect, perhaps even centuries. We don't know yet because this is the first experiment we are so far running where uh, the species does not have uh, an open frontier. Over the last 100 years, we've developed and uh, refined our economic systems to give us additional leverage so that we can optimize our distribution pathways uh, for resources, food, energy, um, and economy, and create uh, ever superior capabilities and technologies. We will continue to do that 
as we expand outwards by building the same infrastructures and the same systems in locations beyond Earth. And we'll be building cities on other planets, um, highly innovative, highly capable. And in fact, we already build cities in um, uh, inhospitable regions. Actually, this is Dubai. Um, and uh, you know, it's kind of spot the difference. So when you think about it here, this is built in desert. This is built in a desert that 50 years ago was juggling pearls. Infrastructure, power, roads, concrete, food, water, people, transportation, education, ideas, health, everything was imported in to become then a self-sustaining, integrated, integrated uh, local culture. This is actually an example of something that will happen somewhere in the next 100 to 200 years um, on the lunar surface, uh, on Mars. Everything that is going on in Dubai, if you, uh, if you can imagine um, uh, shorts and t-shirts being replaced with perhaps environmental suits, everything happening on, uh, in Dubai is representative of the logistics supply chains uh, that you would need for um, in-space operations and development of infrastructure. It's just a transportation issue. That's the only key, is just transportation access, because everything else actually exists. If there are two takeaways that you take away from my talk, the first is my email address, jim.caravalla at shackletonenergy.com. Everything else can go from, for, flow from there. The second is that water is the oil of the solar system. Water is the oil of the solar system. Oil has underpinned our economic growth uh, for well over a century now. It has defined us as a culture and a civilization and a species and allowed us to develop and go forward uh, and build uh, great uh, economic systems. Without access to that high density energy source, our world would be very different today and our uh, level of options would be very different. As Rob was uh, alluding to uh, earlier this morning, should the point of peak oil actually arise, should our economic access to resources be limited, our opportunities and options for then going forward and developing the uh, ability to reach out, extend beyond the frontier may well be curtailed sometime within this century if we don't act. What are the real ultimate pressures that we're facing and why are we trying to do something like this when, uh, when it wouldn't make sense and it would be much more profitable for us to go and make paper clips or bake donuts? By mid-century, we're going to have about 10 billion people. It could be 9 billion, it could be 11.2, uh, the range is open. But there's going to be a few more. The majority of that growth is going to be in the global south that growth is going to uh, come with an increase of utilization of resources, an increase of expectation of a lifestyle, of education, access to health. Families, parents want the best for their children and their loved ones. It's a human driver, uh, and it's a universal human right uh, to be able to share those uh, privileges. The, uh, you, know, you can select any number of figures that you want to make your case. Effectively, one could say that economic access to resources always gets a little bit harder. Sometimes it plateaus, sometimes it falls through the floor as new processes and technologies uh, allow a liberation of uh, mineral resources. But at some point, the constraints will come. In addition to those constraints, uh, on the mineral uh, side, the energy, the, the key is the energy uh, consumption that we are undertaking. At the beginning of the century, six billion people were using roughly 15 terawatts uh, electric of power. Um, by mid-century, nine to 10 billion people will be using around 30 terawatts of power. By the end of the century, it could double again to 60 terawatts, depending on, on where the economy goes. If you stack up all of the uh, energy sources and uh, uh, production capability we have, adding up the hydrocarbons, nuclear, fusion, fission, antimatter, fairy dust, whatever it is you want to try and put in together, we still have an energy gap 
in our uh, production capability going towards mid-century and subsequently. The energy gap doesn't have to be an absolute limit that we have to face and experience before we feel the pressures of it. We already feel the pressures of difficulties of energy distribution, localization of energy ownership uh, and sources. Uh, we, we know um, how that transpires. So to avoid that, we need to find a solution that fills that gap on a planetary scale and solves the problem once and for all. This is, this is not a joke, this is a responsibility we have. There may be a window of opportunity uh, to address the problem. If we leave it too long, it becomes harder and harder uh, to get the organized will of uh, a million minds to work on the problem. But space-based solar power can solve that problem. It is the best technological solution that exists for supplying 15, 30, 60, 100 terawatts electric of power uh, for the planet and the uh, cislunar region and for lighting up the solar system and providing uh, interplanetary highways for uh, solar-powered electric vehicles. This is the kind of lead times we're talking about is in the 10, 20, 30, 50 year timescales. The thinking, planning, preparation time is in the 10, 20, 30, 50 year timescales. There is no time to waste before we start a program like this. So how do you address um, such a challenge when the strategic uh, necessity is so far off? We all know the uh, analogy of the you know, drop a frog in uh, cool water, raise the temperature slowly, and you've got uh, frog legs. Uh, you put a frog in boiling water, it'll jump out immediately. Well, one of the, one of the reasons why we have such uh, difficulties in getting past this problem is that it is really difficult to actually solve. And why is that? Well, every time we want to take that 300 miles straight up, it'll cost us, this will be about 8,000 euros. It's $10,000 a kilogram to take anything to just the lowest Earth orbit. $50,000 a kilogram to take it to where our geostationary satellites sit that allow us to talk on our phones. You want to get to the lunar surface today? It's somewhere between $500,000 and a million dollars a kilogram in, in cost, depending on which architecture you use. Earth is big. It makes our gravity heavy. Our atmosphere is thick. And so we have an interesting strategic problem of how do we get our vehicles and our systems out of this when the, the best of our technology allows us just to make it where most of what we're sending up actually just gets destroyed and burnt up. Over, well over 90% of what we launch just burns up. $100 million burns up in smoke in 15 minutes. Uh, it'd be like uh, driving from here to Oslo um, taking three years to plan the trip, carrying with you three tons of uh, gasoline, <coughs> destroying your car once you're there, destroying your container of gasoline, and then waiting a while to come back, and then planning it all again. But you don't plan and build the same thing. You plan and build a different thing uh, just for the fun of it, because uh, you can. That's that's, uh, if you want to know about innovative processes, that's how bad we are in the space industry. Uh, we can't even think about how to do this properly. So we have limitations to space uh, at this stage. So 85% of everything going uh, up into orbit is actually propellant. I won't go into too much detail here, but it gets even worse. Once you're in the low Earth orbit, just 300 miles up, you need even more fuel, even more fuel, just to get anywhere else. So once you want to go to the Moon and Mars, you've got to take most of your stuff you take to orbit is actually just fuel again. So if we can do something different, if we can think out of the box and think really innovatively, we could do something radical that no one on the planet has done before. If we have a vehicle, we could have a fueling station or a gas station. No one's ever done this before. Frankly, we've done it for thousands of years. If you have a horse, and it runs out of fuel, you refuel it, and you carry on. This, this shit ain't hard, you know? And um, this is the kind of thing that we've been doing I'm in the space industry. We're extreme innovators, we're very clever, we're extremely clever, we do things differently, 
we're not going to do that. We're going to build them one at a time because they're fun. And so that's what we've been doing the last 50, 60 years. But now we've got a real job to do. There is a species that is reaching certain limitations of uh, economic uh, integrity. Uh, and we, need a, we have a job to do to provide the uh, energy sources necessary to allow growth uh, to occur smoothly. So propellant depots in space, that allows us to refuel our spacecraft. If we can get that fuel from somewhere where it doesn't cost $10,000 a kilo to use, it would be even better. There is somewhere where it's cheaper, where the gravity is less. If the gravity is less, the energy is lower. And in space, it's all about energy. So if you can use less energy, and on the moon, you can use much, much less energy. If you can use much less energy, then we're doing something really great because now it becomes much cheaper to get the water from the lunar poles. Why water? Because water we can put into our depots and refineries and split it into hydrogen and oxygen, base constituents of water. But you bring those together quickly, and that's super bang rocket fuel. And that allows us to travel anywhere in space very efficiently and effectively. Once we've done that, there's a sequence here. It's a logic. You, know, so you have to rattle the throats of the space industry folks to kind of um, get them to think like this. But once you've done that, you can then use systems to utilize the material on the moon, build things, and you can build space-based solar power satellites. You can build new vehicles. You can solve a lot of environmental problems that are just hanging around outside our Earth at the moment. One of the big problems is space debris. Yeah. I don't know who's heard of space debris. I mean, yep. Yeah. This is one of the most critical economic problems a lot of people haven't heard of. If some of our orbits get so much junk that the spacecraft start flying through this junk and fragmenting, one fragmented spacecraft probably leads to another half a dozen fragmented spacecraft very quickly. That fragmented set of spacecraft might clean up the whole orbit. That could occur in a period of weeks or months if a certain limit, uh, tipping point, is reached. And there are many specialists and experts who worry about when we may or may not reach that tipping point. In order to try and reduce the risk of that, we should clear away some of the junk and mess that we've made over the last 50 years of throwing this stuff up. I mean, space is a big place, but when you're traveling at 17,000 miles an hour and there's hundreds and thousands of bits traveling at that speed in different directions going around. Uh, this is, this is something, something that demands attention as well. So if we've got a lot of fuel in space, we can solve a bunch of these problems. We can build things. We can build space-based solar power satellites. We can solve the debris problem. If there are big asteroids coming towards us, we can have vehicles that can have the propellant necessary or the fuel necessary to go and nudge them out of the way. So there are a lot of things going on uh, that we could do once you've got this architecture in place. It's not so expensive relatively at a global infrastructure level. And so with all of these super benefits of, once again, cascading issues, and once you've got space-based solar power, by the way, I should uh, make note something very specific. We have a fresh water crisis looming as well, if not already upon us. Once you have space-based solar power um, available, you have unlimited excess desalinization opportunities. This creates fresh water directly in the regions that are, it's most needed for irrigation, crops, health, uh, etc. And that lives, gives a cascade of civilization uh, benefits. So if this is all great, why aren't we doing it? It's a very interesting story. And this, is, this I think, has um, repercussions in any organization. I, obviously, I'm going to pick on uh, global space agencies and institutional uh, aerospace uh, organizations, but you can look in any sector, in any industry, and you will note the same endemic issues. And maybe by looking at some of these extreme examples, it'll help shed light on how to solve some of them. At the time of Apollo, go Apollo, uh, at the time of Apollo, we had very strong political leadership on the back of a, a strong national economy uh, able to do a lot of things. That political leadership had congressional support and an effectively unlimited budget and a confidence and a technological innovation curve that allowed an intersection of opportunity to create the Apollo missions to achieve a goal of sending a man to the moon and bringing him safely back to Earth before the end of that decade. This was a unique point in history and an enabler 
for a great technological and programmatic feat. On the back of that, we effectively created a civilizational technological boost that has, we are so far still riding the wave of that. Okay, we don't have too many flying cars and jetpacks just yet, but we have extraordinary technology um, that al is allowing us to push the boundaries of uh, our longevity, our health, and uh, all sorts of other benefits. A lot of that came from the, the, the forcing function of having to deal with space and having to deal with humans in space and operations out in that environment. So it's a very good forcing function for terrestrial benefit. So what's happened today, 50, 60 years on, is that the, the agency that formed, i.e. NASA uh, and the Russian Space Agency around that time, uh, also a very dynamic organization in its own way, the, these two um, organizations have now over half a century become bureaucratic dinosaurs. So instead of having political leadership as the driving force behind it, you have political constraint as the driving limitation. The constraint is driven by the desire of constituent stakeholders to basically get support for whatever it is for their, their vested agenda. They will, they will allocate the minimum budget to achieve that agenda. So far, no one said anything about the program. No one said anything about technology requirements. It's about what do I need to allocate to get the votes I need to serve the needs of, uh, um, that concern me as a decision maker. At that point, once the minimum budget has been uh, negotiated, whatever available technology can be squeezed into this uh, round peg uh, is used. And because we don't want to spend anything more than is necessary, we won't put the additional investment in to create production and infrastructure engineering. Uh, within this sector. We'll just do a one-off because that's going to serve my needs politically to get the votes I want. I'm still even perhaps not even sure what the mission is going to be. It's just got to have serve the jobs that are needed. And although this is a kind of a skewed and extreme example, this is occurring uh, every time, uh, every year with billions of dollars of budget in several agencies worldwide. And I'm pretty sure that you see a function of this going on in every major organization today uh, as well. What that, leads, what that leaves is a strategic leadership gap. When your starting point is a set of constraints and the end point is a decision bounded by those constraints, all you're able to do is to operate within very, very tight parameters. And the parameters that you have to operate are uh, between are uh, at one side, you have to be as gung ho as you can be to bullshit your way so that the project gets undertaken. So you have so much optimism bias in the program or the project that you're trying to generate that you try and convince your stakeholders to make the decision to take it forward. In order to make sure that it additionally goes through from the budgetary side, you limit the budget as well. So instead of creating a balanced perspective of what can be done and what must be done, you say, this is what we're going to do, and this is what we're going to need. And the real world just doesn't get a look in at any point in time. What that creates, every time, without fail, it's not guesswork, there's no need to experiment, there's no A-B testing needed, it just happens every time, you get a feasibility gap, both in expectations and capability and delivery. That feasibility gap is a critical malaise in our society, in our, in our economic development as a species. It gives us compromised infrastructure, especially on the space sector. We are not able to make use of production engineering and leverage the know-how that we have. We're not able to accelerate incremental development cycles. Everything is one-off. The know-how barely passes from one generation to the next. And the most critical and, frankly, criminal uh, aspect is a time economy and opportunity loss uh, that we face. It's a, it's a critical issue. And we, we undertake this formula with scary precision each time uh, we repeat that. If you then repeat that continuously, and every next project that you undertake, you do the same process, you have the same management decisions, the same constraints uh, in your organization, 
the same limitations on budget, innovation, uh, and imagination, and visionary, bold leadership. Eventually, the decisions and the reasons for the decisions of the programs that are started and the decisions that are made kind of evaporate and disappear, whether it was you know, optimism, whether it was budgetary constraint, doesn't matter. Those kind of reasons fall by the wayside. All that happens is that you get left with a bunch of projects that may do some good things that you can point to, but ultimately, there's no connection between any of them. They're fragmented, they have multiple feasibility gaps within their architectures and propositions, and we're in a lot of trouble 50 years later. Uh, this works when you've got a lot of infrastructure. If you've got infrastructure, you can throw a bit of crap at the wall, some of it will stick, but the stuff that falls will fall on a platform or a foundation and can be reused and done again. This is actually called the Silicon Valley model, um, and venture, venture firms are very fond of it uh, in Silicon Valley, and it works if you've got a very mature sector where the iteration cycles of your innovation frontier are very short. You go back to an infrastructure uh, sector which is totally immature, has no foundational infrastructure, trying to then apply this methodology uh, it creates a disaster. So what we need is some aggressive leadership, both commercial and public leadership combined, to shape the system by its uh, foundations and create a new paradigm and a new opportunity of going forward. Frankly, for better or for worse, the, the driving uh, framework is economic necessity. If something makes money and can be seen to make money in some time scale, it has a chance of getting stakeholders to support it. That's it. Let's not try and innovate our 10,000-year-old uh, economic structure just yet. So first thing to look at is market. Forget about technology. Forget about anything else. Is there a need for what we're doing? And this is a danger. I mean, we had some conversations, as uh, Christian was alluding to. We had some conversations about need this week. And guys were saying, we have a need, but we, the need we have is now. And I was like, nodding dutifully. Like, very good. How do you address the need you have three weeks afterwards? But that's not our business. We need to address the needs now. All right, it's three year time scale, not three weeks. I'm being a bit flippant. But how do you address the, the needs three years from now? We need to sort uh, urgency right now. It was extraordinarily um, concerning. Let's put it that way. So your market has to, your market assessment and your, uh, the addressing of needs has to go over a period of time. You have to take multiple segments of time. It has to work on one year, one year time scale. It doesn't necessarily have to generate revenue. It has to work on a one year, three year, five year, but it has to have a 10 year, 15, 20 year context so that you can undertake strategic growth as well. In the space sector, as a visceral example, we have a um, very interesting assessment of the market, which is not really well known. The, in the space sector, people don't really understand, well, what is our market? I don't know. We're, we're going to sell data to some agency or something, and we have three customers over two years. So this will be good. This is our market. Well, there, there's little understanding that if there's no end user, there's no market. Well, you, you might have a customer. You might have a buyer. But that buyer is then subject to any whim of decision of the stakeholders that have frightening constraints of optimism, bias, and budget. If you have an end user that is using something, a tool or something where they're going to use it again and again and there's a real need, it doesn't matter if you've got 10 nodes in your supply chain or your market chain, you have a market. Well, in the space sector, there is a market definition that we can point to, especially in the transport side, because frankly, space at the moment is majority transport. On one side, we have transport from the ground to low Earth orbit. On the other side, well, is this a road to nowhere? We need destinations. Well, actually, there are, there are destinations as well. So we have some transport, we have some destinations. But there is a missing component in the middle. And many folks in this town will be very much aware of what the component is, but it doesn't dawn on the community in the space sector which has the responsibility for driving this forward. On the transport side, so it's energy, of course, the paradigm buster. On the transport side, we have uh, a number of uh, players already 
attempting to create opportunities to get from the ground to low Earth orbit. It's clumsy, it's messy, we keep blowing the stuff up each time. We haven't quite worked it out how to make it be able to use twice for the most part, but we're getting there. SpaceX is taking the lead on that. Uh, NASA did some effort over the last 30 years with shuttle, um, but we're, we're getting there. In about 30 to 50 years, uh, the idea of an expendable uh, vehicle to go from the ground 300 miles up will be, will be seen as, uh, as quaint as a crank uh, starter for your car. We have destinations. Right now, they're completely kind of untapped and useless. They're, you know, it's just desert. But we've seen time and time again in the most inhospitable regions, we can flourish and, and make society. So the key is, how do you connect those things together? You need a transport and energy network. We've done it before countless times when we're expanding frontiers, and this is what we need to do again. The energy network that we can create allows us to build a road to many new markets, many new industries, many new businesses and for thousands and millions of people to expand out into space and within three to five generations, a billion people in space. Ten generations, three billion. By the end of the 22nd century, 10, 20 billion people or more. Massive, unlimited growth and expansion. Extraordinary opportunities that are possible uh, should we take this forward. If we identify those opportunities and build the business models necessary and identify the technologies and freeze the choices of technological and programmatic pathways, we already have the capital, regulatory, infrastructure and political environments to take this forward without question. We could have gone, to, we could have gone out to space as a species to stay from 1972 onwards. It's just how much of an effort, how much pain would it take for us to do it? Well, we're getting to the point where it's, the pain point is getting very low. We, are in, we have the highest concentrations of capital wealth at every class of investment uh, level necessary today, and the opportunities for markets and investment return to even satisfy those stakeholders whose vision is myopic enough that they're focusing on quarterly and annual returns. Well, we can make those people happy too. When you take that strategy and that structure, what you then uh, arrive at is effectively a roadmap algorithm for uh, establishing infrastructure organizations and an infrastructure organization of extraordinary growth, one that specifically exists where there is no prior market. We are market makers. We are creating new frontiers um, that have not yet existed. You can see this. You can see these notes uh, in detail afterwards, so I won't go into uh, into too much depth just for um, speed. But if we ap apply this retrospectively to some of the um, the great pushes we've had uh, over the over recent history, well, in you know, in great fashion, we can map anything onto anything we want and, and, and make it work. But you can look at any kind of ventures. I mean, here we're looking at uh, Columbus's expedition. You can see he had all the necessary issues of capital, business model, technology, environment, and made it all that work. If any one of those elements didn't really exist, um, it's very unlikely that the that program would have been able to proceed. And probably for one Columbus, there were 50 uh, other sea captains who also spent a decade trying to uh, get a small fleet together. But the returns for um, the stakeholders were significant. Whether or not they imagined as much or as little, who knows, because it's highly speculative. But at some point, you can get this um, uh, connection of infrastructure requirements together with the leadership, again, the market need, business model. Here in the case of Vanderbilt with uh, steamships and railroads, he took his, uh, uh, his family fleet of steamships, sold it, invested heavily into the railroad architecture, took a big gamble, and expanded across the uh, continental United States um, to establish uh, a network that um, uh, experienced uh, exponential growth. And with that, 
With that had significant returns of capital, enabled transport, enabled the connection of the western east coasts uh, of the United States, and drove technology and precision engineering um, as the locomotives improved across the board. Vanderbilt also integrated um, the, and, and helped develop the oil sector uh, because much of the early transportation of uh, the first great movements of oil uh, was by rail before um, Rockefeller got impatient and started building pipelines. But once again, the, the capital was there, the technology that was there, the need was there, the opportunity for markets and growth, and the strong, shall we say, persistent leadership uh, was there to make it happen. And again and again, the leadership is the key to making everything happen. It's the very kernel, the very core of everything that we see. We, in this town, we see a trillion dollars of infrastructure. That, all of that came from mind, from the human mind. Everything that is generated, every decision that was made was by someone making a commitment, someone taking a risk to say, we will do this. And always, that risk is taken in the face of others saying, you shall not do this. Always. And that's what it takes to get this sort of thing going. And then we move to the, we take these historical analogs and we move forward to the frontier that is upon us now. We have a solar system that beckons. <coughs> we have resources, we have opportunity, we have a species to protect. The, the likes of us sitting in this room have the thought processes, the mental bandwidth, the time to ad adopt and think about these issues, not only to think about them, but to address them and to do something about them. It's the responsibility of a very, very few to serve a very large majority. We have the markets necessary, power, energy, fresh water for 10 billion people, 35 years away. 35 years ago was 1985. I still remember it. I know it doesn't look like it, but I remember it. Uh, I'm, sh I'm sure many of us do. And uh, so, um, 35 years, in 35 years' time, 2015 is just going to be nostalgic. It wasn't so long ago. It was just 2015. 1985 wasn't so long ago. I mean, um, Olay, I mean, I don't know who it was, uh, it was dancing, but it was... Uh, you know, I remember Kajigugu and that. It, you know, it's, it, it's not ancient history. And it's not the far future. It is not the far future. It is now. Because the decisions to serve the generation in that time have to be made now. It's our responsibility right now. There is an urgency to do that. So we have the leadership to do this. We have a market. We have a business model that demonstrates multiple integrated streams of return across many uh, uh, existing, latent, and nascent markets uh, cascading out. We have all the technology we need. We have choices of technological uh, opportunity. There are some engineering challenges. Uh, there are some engineering unknowns, but there are engineering unknowns. It just needs to be solved. There are no physics unknowns. We don't need warp speed or anything like that uh, at this point in time. We have the geographic, geological, physical, resource, uh, regulatory, political environment to allow something like this to happen. Is it perfect right now? Not quite. But it's not an obstacle. We certainly have the capital and we have the investment return opportunities. Why is it not happening right now today? Well, let me just get off the phone and I'll, I'll check if it has happened yet. But we're getting there, we're on the cusp, where the field of view of our risk profile is starting to touch the outer boundary of the risk profile of the first catalytic investors. That tip of that frontier is a credibility gap. And that credibility gap is coming within the field of view for credibility. And the, the time is happening now. It's, it's really happening in these months uh, these weeks, months, and fraction of a year. Leadership. Nothing, nothing happens without leadership. It's, it's something that we hear glibly about. 
Uh, I think there's a couple of courses at Harvard Business School on it and other MBAs. You could almost have half your time thinking about leadership, half the time thinking about the rest. The leadership is so key because every time you state something as a leader, you'll need to state it 10 more times in different ways to 100 other stakeholders and be combated at every step of the way. You'll have arrows in your back uh, along the way. And you need to undertake something that, a form of engineering that is very, very uh, rarely spoken about. The engineering is mindset engineering. Mindset engineering is the hardest problem this side of physics uh, to undertake and understanding women. But that's a different story. But mindset engineering allows us to address the issues of different groups of stakeholders. The first group of stakeholders in our context is space agencies. Why can't big space agencies lead? Why can't they say, this is what we need to do, let's go forward and do it? They can't lead because they don't have the mandate for profitability and revenue generation. It's a government organization. Unless you can generate revenue and stimulate and enthuse those that respond to profit, you can't, you can't lead and you can't drive it forward. And you can't generate profit unless you can optimize and leverage your uh, infrastructure and the developments and the production that you've built. So if you can't create efficiencies and optimization and production engineering, you cannot generate profit. And space agencies are, are at the opposite end of the spectrum to deal with this. Large corporations, uh, Fortune 500 companies, major energy companies and infrastructure companies, why can they not lead? Well, they're ossified in their thinking, their mandate. Now, uh, early 21st century, many of them have become mature organizations whose leadership is three, four generations away, perhaps, of the uh, innovative entrepreneurial leadership that built the company in the early stages of the S-curve. Now they've gone through a double inflection, they're at the top of the curve, it's a flatlined maturation state. They're just holding the ship steady. That's our job, we'll hold it steady till uh, I hand off to the next leadership. Uh, and I'll, I'll try not to screw it up in the meantime. It's, it's the classic ostrich in the sand, head in the sand uh, uh, conundrum. And it's, it's the reason why many large organizations tend to mature to a quiet sunset. But um, after, at the end of this talk, we'll know that this doesn't need to happen. Are the small companies, well, small companies tend to innovate. We tend to talk about big visions, doing something for the world. You know, if you're going to address something big, let's do it really big. We're going to build the most significant app that there's ever been on the iPhone, and it is going to have premium services. And this is, this is really the culture in many um, uh, high innovation zones where really it's just hidden code for give me a one to three year exit, give me five to 10x, and I'll say you're a cool dude. And that's, that's the culture that we have uh, for better or for worse. It allows those who love their families and, and uh, the, the people around them to generate value and protect them and give them resources and food and shelter. It's, it all comes down to very base needs and principles, so it's human nature. There are some that go beyond human nature, in the best way, um, and there, there are a few that can lead, um, w without uh, any hubris or um, arrogance in any way. The team at Shackleton Energy is dedicated um, to tackling uh, this problem, to identifying the solutions, and to making it happen even if it takes more than our lifetime, we will set it up for the next generation to carry the flag to finish the job. It hopefully won't take that long, but it doesn't matter if it does. However long it takes is however long it takes. But it's not a job we can do on our own. This is a team effort. This is a global effort. It's a public-private super partnership. So we will integrate all of these organizations. We already have a very significant consortium of sovereign states major corporations, small companies, and space agencies on the team. That leadership consists at the core of a great man, and around that great man, great people. Uh, three founders, Bill Stone, uh, 
expeditionary uh, genius, led some of the most uh, daring and adventurous um, missions into the Earth's crust uh, of anyone alive. So 100 people missions over four months in duration, going 10 kilometers into the, uh, into the crust, some of the most daring, boldest uh, uh, ventures of our day, utilizing technology that we built, our own life support equipment, uh, navigation, uh, and other tools. Um, and out of that 100 people over four months, maybe two people are at Camp 4 to reach the pinnacle of discovery and opportunity. Uh, Dale Teets, Pentagon uh, Colonel and Mission Manager, uh, and myself, who's thrown a number of toys into low Earth orbit uh, over the years as well. And around us, we have a great team um, of uh, uh, up to 130 people uh, who make this work uh, and are taking us to the point we're at now. But I want to just address uh, another little bit mindset thought here. Uh, I'm going to be another 15, uh, Christian. Um, another thought on, my, on, on the mindset. Let's look at the internet. We all, we all know and recognize the internet and the development path. If we look at the period from the late 60s onwards, we can see the familiar uh, roadmap of how the web uh, came on board, our connectivity was enabled, and our little supercomputers in our pockets was, uh, you know, was there. Let's just take a look uh, at, a, at a w what would happen if space sector leadership as it has been for the last 50 years, was in charge of our computational development. Be scared. In 1970, the government would have issued a telexnet, been a government program. We would have had mainframe interconnections um, released step-by-step, uh, step, and by the 80s, they would have, the government would have issued contracts to major corporations to build mainframe computers in the most competitive way possible. So that by, the, by 2001, computer tourism would have taken off. The public could have access to go and see a computer in, the, in one of the local institutes and museums. And by 2010, if we were really lucky, we would have had um, uh, the results of that competitive uh, efficiency and would have standalone terminals, maybe with screen cathode ray tubes that had multiple colors. Uh, possibly, yes, not just green screens. So this would have been our government computer program uh, as, it, as the space industry has been led, uh, more or less today. If, uh, if we flip the uh, analogy and the context, what would happen if the space sector had been liberated to the same extent that uh, the interconnectivity of the internet sector had been uh, done? Well, let's say, for example, just to take one example for fun, the X-15 aerodynamic codes for flight to uh, supersonic and near hypersonic speed. If that was released uh, into the wider community, wow, what could we have all done with that? By 1980, we would have had uh, uh, multi-engine airframe capability uh, going into, um, uh, into orbit. We would have had standards by the 80s, standards and interconnectivity for modular systems and major meta-systems connecting together in orbit. We'd have had structures just like perhaps we have with petrol stations and, uh, and uh, petrol tanks today, or three-pin plugs or two-pin plugs or whatever. Uh, standardization allows expansion and efficiencies across sectors and growth. Th the 2000 Olympics could have been on the moon, and today, instead of you know, upper middle class uh, segment being able to buy a small Cessna, or a fast car, or a you know, fraction in a jet, uh, maybe there'd be a million owners of uh, space cars jumping up and down in orbit. It's not a joke. It's, you, you, can, you can think about it for 10 minutes, and it's quite a viable uh, sector mapping. And as I was saying earlier, this is about mindset engineering. This is the most you know, fundamentally difficult uh, form of engineering to undertake, in my, in my view. There are probably a few hundred or a few thousand human beings on this planet who map together the string of sentiment, desire, thought, intelligence, assessment, judgment, action, commitment, persistence, and results to fall among that carter. There's very, very few. In order to do that, you have to forego the normal societal constraints of 
income uh, confidence, of growth, uh, financial growth, of expectation of annual returns, of worrying about your uh, investors or stakeholders. You have to turn all of that on your head, on its head, and focus, keep focusing on what the big mission is. It's leadership every moment of every day, uh, internal leadership to maintain that. It's very hard, not many people do it. Around seven billion people are following a very understandable, a very sensible, and a very balanced um, process of optimize, optimizing resource metrics. Basically creating a balanced distribution system of resources, food, time, energy, uh, and uh, allocating a metric system to that so that we don't have to carry around bales of rice and give it to one person uh, uh, in place of a euro. So around 7 people, billion people are doing that. In order to reach these places, we need these. The only way to do this is to somehow connect the two communities or the two cultures of humanity together. There's no way on earth or off earth will convince these seven billion people that this is something we should do for the greater good of humanity and the greater good of the trillion people that will come before us or after us. There's no way to do it. We need an API. We need an application interface between sentiment of the species and operation of the species. That API is leadership. It's a profound level of leadership that will enable us as a civilization to move forward and do what we have to do. And so if we try and address a segment, a representative segment of this 7 billion, let's look at, say, mature oil industry and how that works. So this I'll whiz through. We know what happens here, whether it's uh, gas or whether it's oil. And the same can be said for the mining sector. The folks in these industries are basically the heroes of civilization. For, the, for thousands of years, we have demanded, as a species and a culture, we've demanded to take stuff out of the ground, whether it's material or energy, and make our world better. And time and time again, uh, the, the, the people of, of these uh, industries, uh, for thousands of years, have risen to that challenge and undertaken this. And today, although there's, you know, we, we worry about whether oil is at uh, you know, 100 or $40 uh, a barrel, we worry about minutia of uh, optimization or growth or strategic directions to downsize or to expand. These are, chal these are challenging times because so much is at stake for these organizations and this industry. It's a $6 trillion uh, annual industry. It's the backbone of our economic civilization today. And the concern is <clears throat> that the fuel industry is either going to have to change drastically or be very significantly constrained. I've learned something new even in my few days here. Um, and uh, I'll come to my conclusions at the end of the talk. And I think. Uh, they may not have such an impact here, or they may, but I think in the communities that I serve and uh, walk in, the impact will be so profound that it will be missed uh, for quite a while. But the fuel industry uh, also expands off Earth. We do exploration. In our supply chain, we'll do exploration as well. Not for oil, for gas, but for water. Water is hydrogen, oxygen, rocket fuel. That's the first exploration. We'll also build uh, the vehicles and the transport systems to take all of that. No need to worry so much about the detail, but just to demonstrate that there are uh, architectures that are akin to what the oil industry is used to anyway. Extraction, transportation, modification, transportation, supply, gathering, storage, power provision, retail, and uh, repeat. It's the same programmatic aspects, the same mindset, 
it's the same opportunity. It just happens that it's a new field. The field is a little bit further away, and your transport system is a little bit different. The atmosphere is a bit different, the gravity is a bit different, but those are small issues. I mean, we can just <coughs> ignore those for now. But for the most part, it's the same, it's the same uh, context and same system. That's a, that's a fuel uh, uh, and energy company. In the same way that the oil and gas industry has technologies that they use, we have technologies that we need to address and build with. Uh, whether it's uh, a new form of modularity, whether it's propulsion, whether it's inflatable main bodies or fuselages um, th that we can then uh, build, or, or whether it's different types of um, uh, technologies around it. And we've built many of these already. Uh, we have patents on a, on a number of them in terms of power, transportation, um, uh, inflatables, uh, behavioral autonomy and navigation, and life support. Just in the same way, the oil industry is, and the gas industry is rich with technological capability that would allow us to leapfrog some of the uh, things that we're doing. And it's very, it becomes very clear that there is uh, the amount of technological and programmatic effort that has been made to extract resources from some of the world's harshest regions on Earth may, not, may have differences. I mean, we may be talking about temperature differences, material differences, gravitational differences, but they're all numerics. The differences are all variables. The thought processes and programmatics in risk assessment, in uh, technological development, in testing, in deployment, in understanding of extreme environments. Wow, I mean, the oil, gas, mining sectors have decades, decades, even centuries more experience of these kinds of issues and challenges than we do in the space industry. In the space industry, we're a bunch of transport prototypers. We're, we're kind of in 1908 of building a truck. You know, it's kind of fun. We like doing it. We like making sure it blows up after a few minutes. We can build another one and, and have fun. But meanwhile, uh, the guys in these sectors are actually doing the real work that uh, allow us to move on, on as a civilization. So we're taking what, we are, what we've done in our consortium and, and building that forward. We've got a great deal of experience in our team. We do have some uh, mining folks uh, in the team, and we have a lot of relationships uh, with the oil sector as well, and that's growing uh, as we bring these communities together because it is going to be a team effort. And we can take that mining, expeditionary experience, robotics capability, and bring that forward, and that allows us to mature uh, into what is effectively the first industrial astronaut corps and industrial space program uh, on Earth. It's a multi-phase program. I'm just going to dance through that. Um, we have a number of customer segments, uh, just spinning back here. Early customers of satellite operators, the first major market that exists. It's um, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars market uh, currently. We can optimize and increase that market by having our fuel in space ready so you could launch really big satellites without having to, out, having to launch all that extra fuel with you. So now we can build bigger spacecraft and then we can even build super spacecraft or, or hyper communication satellites, which are effectively man-tended platforms, much more like a server farm in geostationary orbit that would allow very high bandwidth over the next 10 to 20 years um, in place. We have space agencies as customers. One space agency has said, whatever propellant we put in space, they would buy all of it if we would let them. And the, there will be a high demand for this fuel and capability. Nations that don't currently have a space program for a fraction of what it takes to build one of these spacecraft on a production um, uh, line, would have, would have astronaut time, access to space. For a little bit more, they would have access to uh, planetary surface as well. It'd be a liberation of a, a new era of uh, space exploration, uh, perhaps even uh, akin to the golden age of the Renaissance. In addition, uh, we have launch partners. We can optimize launch operations so that the launch partners who partner with us can create end-to-end -end services and one-stop solutions for their customers to transport their vehicles to whatever final destination beyond low Earth orbit uh, because we'll manage the additional fuel and transport requirement. And you know, ultimately, what we're talking about is the ability for human civilization to settle space. Whatever domain we're at, whatever set of tools and whatever equipment we need, we can take the analogs of how we live on Earth for transportation, for fuel, for power, uh, for uh, industrial uh, utility, and for habitation and living spaces. 
we can take those, and whether it's the moon, Mars, near-Earth asteroids, the asteroid belt, or armadas of ships going out into the outer planets uh, for, for the vast exploration beyond that. Ultimately, before the end of the century, building interplanetary or interstellar dockyards uh, for the first great, vast ventures, uh, where we'll talk about multi-generational communities um, uh, redefining what it means to be a species. Once you have that infrastructure, our space-based solar power uh, capability would allow us to solve the en world's energy problem for good. Solve it for good. Solve the inner solar system energy problem for good. We'll have a transport grid and a power grid in the solar system that will last us for centuries. When you hear about these sorts of things, and we've heard about things like this historically, it's very easy to say, well, this hasn't been done before, so this can't be done in the future. Or I'm not sure how this will work, therefore it can't be done. So we live on our assumptions, and then we act on our assumptions. And it's very, very dangerous to do that. When you act on your assumptions, mistakes get made, opportunities get lost. And then a few years later, you can see how wrong you are. And we have evidence again and again and again of this dynamic, of the fear of uh, the mindset barrier. I mean, it, the Norwegian uh, uh, Geological Survey, 1958, there's no oil off the coast of Norway. And just uh, 10 years later, you've, you've got some of the most grandest pieces of engineering um, known to man. In the same way, just as we have offshore oil platforms today, tomorrow we will have offshore power platforms. These super large uh, global power stations, uh, this may be a half a kilometer across, you can see a little shuttle uh, representative there. These vast power stations built from material sourced from the moon can transfer microwave beam power that, isn't, that is able to permeate the atmosphere uh, uh, quite readily to kilometer-wide arrays on the ground, very simple devices that can transport power locally to local communities without great power losses of thousands of kilometers of uh, transmission lines. You don't have localization of power source uh, and um, control of distribution by a few. You have a liberation of power and energy and ultimately fresh water. The culture and the species and the civilization that that would uh, enable would be vast. A renaissance of opportunity, a renaissance of hope, of capability, and of survivability of species. And I have a contention, in fact, that the oil, gas, mining industries of today is not a small industry of $6 trillion on one planet. This is, in fact, the space industry of tomorrow. And us in the space industry are simply guardians of the job. And we will be transitioning to this community. And these are the kind of things that we'll be building. These are the kind of energies that we'll require, the materials that we'll require as we expand out uh, as a species into the future. So with that, uh, I hope that's been of interest. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.